Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This is quite an honor. Uh, I'm Nati Paso. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Jewish Farm School based in Philadelphia. Uh, Jewish Farm School equips and mobilizes Jews to be part of building a more just and equitable food system. And we do that in three primary ways. Uh, we build the capacity of the Jewish community to live more sustainably. We support the work of urban farms and food justice organizations in Philadelphia. And then we ground these efforts in Jewish traditions and values and the cycles of the Hebrew calendar. So a question that I get a lot running an organization called the Jewish Farm School, aside from huh, is <laughs> what is Jewish farming? And Adrian did a great job this uh, earlier of highlighting some of kind of the core practices. But I kind of want to back up a little bit and, and share kind of my theological understanding of what Jewish farming is. And so to start, we, we start in the beginning. We start in the Garden of Eden, where God places the Adam, the human, formed from the Adama, the earth, in the garden uh, to work it and to protect it. And God says, there is so much abundance in this garden for you. All I ask is that you show the tiniest bit of restraint. <laughs> and so we're in the garden for like 20 minutes. <laughs> And there goes the restraint. <laughs> and so the first time we, we, we kind of encounter farming or agriculture as a, as a real practice, different than, say, tending a garden, is in the repercussions of this act. Right? Cursed is the ground for your sake. In suffering shall you eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. So that's not the most sympathetic view of farming. And so I started asking, what does that mean? What, what, what does that mean for the ground to be cursed? What does this mean for farming to be some sort of either punishment or not part of the original design? And we know that when, we, when humans started farming, there were vast implications for what it meant to be human and the human experience, that we could outsource growing food to a small percentage of the population so that we could all be sitting around in this room right now. None of this would be possible if it weren't for agriculture. And there are, so there are obviously a lot of benefits to it. And we also know that agriculture has some real challenges. And that historically, agriculture has been one of the most oppressive industries uh, in human history. And so I wanted to, to share kind of one way that I see agriculture manifesting as a, as a curse, or, or what this struggle is referring to. And it's, it's, it's really rooted in the idea that agriculture allows us to grow a surplus, which on the, on the surface seems great. But the question is, who controls that surplus? And how the people who control the surplus have enormous power over other people. And this is highlighted in the story of Joseph, who advises the pharaoh. And he interprets his dreams and says, there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And during the years of plenty, hoard all the surplus. Bring it all in to the palace. And then the seven years of famine hit. Not even the seven years, the first year of the famine hits. And all the people of the region come to the pharaoh. And they say, please, give us some food. Take all of our money. Take all of our animals. And in year two, they say, take all of our land. Take our bodies, because we are hungry, we are starving, we need this help. And so we see how quickly the consolidation of power can happen when you control the surplus. And I see that as a little bit of a warning to the Israelite nation and the Jewish people, and really the world as a whole. So the story continues, and the Israelites are part of that. They, they go down to live in Egypt and eventually they become enslaved. And after 200 years, they are freed, and they wander the desert for 40 years, interestingly, reverting to a gathering way of life, living off of the, the, the manna from heaven. And they're about to enter into the land of Canaan, the land of ancient Israel. And for the first time, as a people, they're going to become farmers. And we're told that the land that we are about to enter is not like Egypt. The land is different because in Egypt, because of the Nile, we could just water our gardens all year round. 
but in this land, we're going to be dependent on rain. And we're also going to farm in a different way. And as Adrian mentioned, we're going to leave the corners of our field unharvested for the landless. We're going to leave the gleanings and the forgotten sheaves of wheat. We're going to center the needs of the most vulnerable members of, the, of our community, the poor, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Why? Because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. And that becomes the foundation, really, of the entire Jewish moral code. And in particular, the agricultural code. And there's another reason. Because we don't actually own the land. We don't own its resources. We are here in a human design system, and that system needs to meet the needs of all members of our community. And the beautiful thing is that we have a way of knowing whether it's working, and that's the rain. When the rain comes in its proper time, we know that we are doing our job. The rain becomes an indicator of our collective moral well-being. And that is a powerful tool, and one that having grown up in an Orthodox Jewish home and going to Jewish day schools and synagogue was never really explained to me in that way, right? Because we weren't farmers anymore. So the question, when, when we look at this blueprint, again, that Adrian highlighted so, so beautifully, what we see is that our tradition if we try to, I try to distill out what are the underlying values that animate these practices in the first place. And then how do we bring these values and these practices from a very different time and place in history into, in, in our case, a contemporary, culturally diverse urban context. But we can expand that to just say, how do we bring this into a contemporary context, where some of the issues are the same and some are very different. And so we've started to answer that question. and. and what we found is by working side by side and in solidarity with people in our community who are experiencing the most dire impacts of our food system, that is one way that we can channel the, the values that I draw from our tradition into our work in a contemporary context. But the question that I want to invite us all to think about is how do we do that more broadly? I'm blessed to live in a very, to be part of a very progressive Jewish community in West Philadelphia, but it's very different than most of the Jewish communities in the United States. How, and I imagine they're, it's similar in other communities of faith. So how do we work with our communities of faith, especially those who hold up these stories, hold up these traditions, these texts? How do we invite them to see these values and these practices as really central parts of our uh, religious identity? Thank you.